as you sit here meditating, your sense of you as the meditator can take of any of three roles, usually a combination of all three. But sometimes one role or two roles are more emphasized. The first role is the you as the one who's doing the meditation. You're the one who intends to get the mind to settle down, and you do what needs to be done. Working with the breath, working with the way you talk to yourself, working with the perceptions you hold in mind. See how you can get the mind to settle down and be with the breath as consistently as possible, with as much of a sense of ease as you can manage. There's the potential for ease here. You want to make the most of that. And then there's the you who's supposed to enjoy the results of the meditation, enjoy the calm, enjoy the pleasure, even the refreshment and rapture sometimes. As the breath feels really good, the mind settles down, it doesn't have to jump around. It feels just right here. And then there's the you as the commentator, watching all this, deciding when the you as the producer is doing well or not giving some encouragement to the you as the consumer or the enjoyer of the meditation, checking how much enjoyment you actually get, and then making comments on it. How could you do this better? Or what have you done that's done well? Or how do you remember that? You're going to be playing these three roles. And as I said, sometimes it's the producer that gets emphasized, sometimes the enjoyer, sometimes the commentator. And all three have to be trained. The commentator seems to be the one that does, does the training, tells the producer what's working, what's not working. And it has to train itself, because a lot of us have a very bad editor in our minds. The commentator can be really harsh, unreasonable. And you have to make sure that you listen to the comments that are actually helpful, that intend to help you settle down. Because sometimes when you're harsh and critical of what you're doing, behind that voice is a voice that wants to give up meditating, so tries to discourage you. You have to watch out for that. In other words, you have to be sensitive to all these different roles and learn how to read your mind to see what's needed at any one particular time. This is why discernment is not just a matter of memorizing a few basic principles and applying them all the time, or telling yourself, if I just learn to accept what the Buddha had to say about the nature of reality, then I'd be okay. Discernment is individual. It comes from your sensitivity, your ability to read a situation and see what's needed. It also involves some imagination. Think of a John Fung's two most common words when he gave meditation instructions. One, be observant. Two, use your ingenuity. It's good to have a sense of the possibilities of what you can do when things are not going well. What alternatives do you have? There may be alternative ways of breathing, alternative places to focus, alternative ways of perceiving the breath, imaging the breath to yourself. Or there are times when you need to use another meditation theme, when the mind is not willing to settle down with the breath. There's something going on in the mind that you have to correct, and you have to think your way out of that unskillful mind state. Because simply telling yourself, well, be with the breath and everything will dissolve away, doesn't work. Again, reading the mind, getting sensitivity and having a sense of your options. This is how your discernment grows. This is why we say it's your discernment. You borrow the Buddha's discernment to help you get some ideas of what's possible. You borrow the discernment of the Ajahns. Ajahn leaves maps of the way the breath can go, or you may have learned some other maps. Qigong, 
Tai Chi will teach you different maps of how the breath should go, how it can go, and you can play with them. There are people who have criticized John Lee for having learned about breath energy when he was in India, saying that they're importing weird Hindu ideas into Buddhism. They don't belong here. Of course they belong. The Buddha himself talked about breath energy going through the body, you know, spreading a sense of well-being through the body, and you do it very well by working with the breath energies, thinking of the breath flowing through the body. But the fact that he was willing to learn, see what he could pick up from outside that was helpful, gave some new insights into what the Buddha had to say. That's something to keep in mind. It's part of the ingenuity part of your meditation. And if you get more sensitive to these different roles that you play inside, you find that they play a role in the world outside as well, in your engagement with the world. You get more sensitive to what you're bringing, where it's skillful, and where it's not skillful, what you can do to change. Because there's an awful lot in the world that we can't change. There are things outside that will trigger you. You can't go around telling the world not to have triggers. After all, this is a world of aging, illness, and death. It's a world where people are kind and people are unkind. People mean well, people don't mean well. It shows up not only in their words, but also in their actions. And if you want a world where everybody is nice, you're in the wrong place. And given that this is where you are, and you want to learn how not to suffer from it, you have to look at, well, what are you doing to create suffering inside? What is your internal producer doing? What is the part of the mind that wants to enjoy a particular pleasure and is not getting the pleasure and starts getting obstreperous? And how is your commentator helping? And what does the commentator know about how to read what's going on and how to think about good alternatives to what you're doing right now? When your system gets set off by events outside, how do you undo that reaction? We start with the breath. And you remind yourself that even though the body may be in a bad breath cycle, you can change it. Consciously breathe in a way that's calmer. Hold in mind perceptions that are calmer. Talk to yourself in ways that calm you down. You can borrow the, the wisdom of the Ajans, the wisdom of the Buddha. But you also have to learn how to produce your own. And John Lee makes this point. We're not really secure on the path until we can start producing our own discernment. And that comes from your sensitivity and your sense of the potentials of what can be done when things are not going well. We're not here just to apply a John Lee's ideas. We're, used, we're here to use them and then work variations on them. He himself worked variations on them, and John Fuing would work variations on them. I once commented to him one time that it would be good if he would write a guide to meditation. And he said, well, everything you taught was there in a John Lee's, keeping the breath in mind. I said, but there were so many interesting details, different perspectives he had on those things. He said, well, that's all there. It's up to each person to learn how to read the basic principles and then work variations on them, because the working variations on them is part of your development of your own discernment. You know, a book that would map out everything that can happen in meditation and everything that you're going to work with it, deal with it, would be too big to be a book. And you get lost in all the details. But if you can learn how to read a situation and come up with 
an approach that works. That's the activity of discernment. And discernment is an activity. It's not just a set of ideas that you're supposed to accept. It's an active part of the mind. As so you bring the mind into concentration so it can be still, so it can observe itself. Basically, you're creating a state of mind that's likely to be discerning, both in the sense of being sensitive and in the sense of learning how to work with options, work with possibilities. And the insights come up, and if they're appropriate to what you do right now, or what you're doing right now, you use them, and then you put them aside. If they're not appropriate, let them go. Don't try to hold on to your old insights. And John Mahabo makes this point. He has lots of techniques for dealing with pain. Learn how to separate your awareness from the pain. In the sense that the awareness and the pain separate out in the same way that oil and water separate out, or oil and vinegar separate out in salad dressing. But as he said, the techniques that worked yesterday may not work today. What works today may not work tomorrow. So it's this ability to keep up coming up coming up with fresh solutions to a particular problem. That's what your insight has to do. It's like having the, the goose that lays the golden eggs. As in any fairy tale, if you try to keep the golden eggs, they turn into ashes or bits of coal. You use the gold right when you've got it, and you keep looking after the goose so that the goose can keep on producing the eggs. Keep looking after the ability to watch your mind, observe it, with the willingness to see new things, and also the ability to remember you've had techniques that have worked in the past. Make you sort through your repertoire, try things out, and get a sense of what works or what tends to work in certain situations. And then you've got a situation where they're not working. What can you do to create another golden egg? You're alert. You're mindful. You're ardent. So you're working on the qualities that create discernment, nurture discernment. Basically, it's developing your sensitivity, developing your ingenuity. And that's how discernment deepens and grows. Mm -hmm.